So at this point, we're building ourselves up to make this button do multiple things. Uh, our proof of concept is that we've we've got a button that is now clickable. This just shows, yeah, we can click it, it recognizes it. Uh, on this one again, I can either delete that line or comment it out. Double slash. So I'm gonna I'm gonna comment out the the alert method. I'm gonna comment it out because uh, we don't need it anymore. We know what that we know that it works. So you can delete it or comment it. And what we actually want to happen is, let's take the text that people type into that box uh, so that we can actually save it or do something with it. So on the next line, we're going to type VAR. This is something we'll do over and over. VAR is var, is variable. A variable is a container, just like this container here. I can hold pencils, I can hold pens, I can hold markers. This container, this is a variable, it varies what it can hold. So therefore, I uh, am creating a container, basically. So the keyword var, to create a variable, I need to then name it. Now this is called cylinder. And I can put in here items into it. So I need uh, I need to name uh, a, a little container, uh, something to hold the name. So I'll call it TMP name, temp name. I'm going to temporarily hold on to the name that the person typed so I can do something with it. I'm making this up. I'm making a container, a variable, to hold the person's name, temp name. Equals. equals has a couple of meanings, but in our case right here, one way to say it is, when we have var and then an equals, usually what that means is that, basically, take the thing on the right of the equals and put it into the thing on the left. So I'm creating, I'm creating this variable, and then I'm putting into it this pen. So in that case, that equals is, is, is an assignment. I'm assigning, I'm putting into that variable something. So if I were to have created a variable and then put in here, don't type this, but just in case, let's say Victor, I would be putting Victor into that variable. That variable would store Victor. But I don't want that, of course. I want it to hold what the person types in the box. Up on line 22, I've made this text box to hold what the person typed into it. And I've named it input name. I want to get what did the person type into input name, and I want to store it temporarily into that variable. So we were gonna we're gonna use again document.getElementById. There's some element on screen in the document. I want to get what's in it. So document.get Yes, you can copy and paste. Element by ID, parentheses. That's the same as before. Document get element by ID. Therefore, I'm going to say, well, which ID am I talking about? So quotes, input name. There's some sort of element, some sort of object on the screen in the document named input input name. Let's let's get what's in that element. And um, specifically, what they wrote. So furthermore, we have to say at the end dot value semicolon. We're, we're at the end of that line. Um, we saw dot on click previously. This is a this is a this is an event that triggers something. In this case, it's something else. Um, it's, uh, it's it's an attribute, I think. 
it's yeah, it's an attribute because uh, up here we would have the attribute of name or the attribute of ID, like we had input of reset type reset value cancel. We have the value, we have the text cancel attached to reset. We didn't explicitly set a value to this input, so it's whatever they typed, but inher it does have inherently value, the attribute value. So here we're saying, let's get that. Let's check what the value is of that input box and store it temporarily in this variable. I want to see that, so we'll do alert temp name. Notice, not in quotes. I'll explain why in a moment. Save it and run it. Type a name into that box. Click the Save button, and you should get back a pop-up that throws back to you the name that you wrote in the box. Let's see. Victor. Click save. Pops back. Victor. John. Save. John. <coughs> you getting back a name? Is everyone getting back a pop-up with a name? Question over here? All right, so if this worked, we've got multiple lines of code here now, all being triggered by clicking that button. Um, this just shows that it's going to pop up right on screen and hit us over the head with it. Let's, this time I'm going to delete it. I'm not going to comment it. Instead, what we're often more times going to do than have a big old alert pop-up like that is we're going to see results in our developers console in our debugger more often than not we're going to make things happen in secret and not show it obviously to the user so instead we're going to write console dot log open close parenthesis semicolon we had document dot something console dot something and technically, alert, I think it's window.alert, window.prompt. There is some sort of object, some sort of element, where we are using the JavaScript. We're using get element upon the document. We're using log upon the console. We're using the method of an object. JavaScript is object-oriented programming. It uses that idiom. What does it mean? We'll talk about it later. But log is a method of the console object. In the console, in the developer's console, I want it to display the name. Temp name. We didn't use the parentheses because that gets us into another topic about, well, we were using quotes previously, 
to display literally this. Exactly, I clicked it again. Or, quote, enter username. We use the, the quotes to display what is known as a literal string. Exactly what's in the quotes, display that. If If I had gone back here and put these items in quotes, and I type Victor, and click Save, temp name. If I had had us do that in quotes, it would literally display temp name, not what is in the variable. So no quotes to then display what's in the variable. If I put it in quotes, I'm going to display the variable, not what's in the variable. Quotes display a string. Um, so what we're doing here with console.log, it's, 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 again, show me what's in the variable, in the developer's console. In quotes, it would have literally said temp name. So let's check this out. It's console.log temp name. Let's save it. I'm running it in Firefox. I'm typing in Victor. I'm clicking save. Mm, nothing. Nothing? No, I'm telling it to go to the developer's console, not on screen. Alert tells it to go on screen. Window.alert. Right into the window, pop it up. This is saying go display it in the console. Every web browser nowadays have a has a developer's console. And oftentimes you can access it on your web browser, on the keyboard, pressing F12. I'm going to see this over and over, but try this. Open it in your browser. I'm in Firefox. In Chrome, it should work the same. Press F12. You should get a brand new screen here. Console. Developer's console. Hey, there's my name. The developer's console. Maybe it'll appear on the right side on your browser. Maybe it won't go to that directly first. Maybe it'll display your code, but you should see somewhere by pressing F12, and it's usually a toggle. It turns it on and off. Console. Did everyone find that? Developer's console. So now if I type Billy, save, output to the console. Oh, I had pressed, I didn't think it worked, so I pressed it nine times, and I told her that you pressed it nine times. Um, putting some other name, save, displays. I click it some more times, it's not going to, depends on the browser, some browser will show it every single time I click it. Browsers nowadays say, well, you clicked it X number of times, and then the number increases. Why well, show it 20 times? I'm just telling you, press it 20 times. We're going to use this a lot. This developer's console gives you output like this. Maybe we don't need to show it off to the user. Maybe we don't have needed to interrupt the on-screen content. We put it in the console. The console here also is a debug console, because if I'm uh, writing my code, click save, no result, but I'm pulled up the console, ooh, syntax error. This also, what it does is it shows you errors in your code. A lot of times, unfortunately, very nerdy, esoteric error messages syntax error. Sometimes they, they're way weirder than that, but at the least if you get errors here it tells you on line 36 column 23 in your current file. Oh, okay, what's going on on line 36? Let's see, 36? Oh, there we go, column 23. Notepad tells you right here too, line 36 column 20. 26. So I see my mistake. I forgot to close that parenthesis. 
some mistakes are going to be a little harder to track down. Again, JavaScript of the three is the hardest. HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Because there could be errors like this, syntax error, which is the fancy way of saying you typed something wrong. You misspelled something. Um, what about this? Temp name, temp name. I'll just type some name, save it. Nothing happens. Console, reference error. Temp name is not defined. Yes, it is. I wrote temp name. What's wrong? Oh, I forgot the capital N. So these sorts of errors right here often are not that human readable. What does reference error mean? Syntax error and such. But at least it's telling me, go check out line 36, column 5. Line 36, column 5. Oh, temp name. And I believe I said previously we have syntax errors, which can be fixed. And then we've got logic errors, which may be harder to fix. Logic errors are like, I wrote all my code properly. All of the code was written properly, syntax-wise. Logically, I forgot to carry the one. Logically, I didn't loop properly. Logically, I'm trying to divide by the wrong number. That kind of error is not based on, did you type your code right? It's, did you figure your code out properly? Did you write it the way it's supposed to be? And those logic errors are oftentimes harder to work with. So we're able, we seem to be able to capture what the person has written in that box. Let's start to store it. Um, I want a variety of names. I want people to be able to fill in a bunch of names, like everyone in this class. I'm going to put everyone's name in this in the, in a variable, and then I'm going to retrieve the name. This is like a very 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 basic database. That's what a database does, doesn't it? You save something to the database, you retrieve something. This is not going to be a database yet. This is going to be um, another JavaScript construct first. Uh, we are going to create another variable. This variable, variables by default, hold one thing at a time. I put in that name. I put in another name. It dumps out what the name was and puts the new one in. This equal assigns the latest name. It throws away the old name, puts in the new name. We can create a certain kind of variable, however, that holds multiple elements, multiple names. That kind of variable is known as an array. It's an array of items. It can hold multiple. It's like a variable that holds multiple variables. It's pretty cool. So we're going to create an, uh, we're going to create an array to hold every name that, uh, that we type in. We're going to do that first by backing up before my document get element by ID. You know, after all this comment stuff, before document get element by ID, make a new line. We'll type uh, var all names. We're going to create this variable, this array first, and then we're going to fill it with names. Uh, we, we created the variable at this moment right here, and at that moment filled it with one name. But I want to create a variable to hold multiple names. We'll talk in detail later about scope. If you have any experience in any other program language, programming language, you might, heard of, you might have heard about scope scope of our variables, how can we use our variables, when we can we use our variables. We'll get to the details later. Uh, but for the moment, let's say we're creating our variable out here. It's a global variable. If I create a variable outside of a function, basically, I can use it anywhere in my, in my code. But if I create a, a variable in a function, I can only use it in that function. We'll see why one would matter. We would see why we would do it that way later. For the moment, let's just say we're creating a variable, a global variable that every one of our functions could use. Right now, only our name save function can use the temp name variable because we've created it in the name save function. This is a variable that will hold multiple variables. It's an array. So we'll say equals. We're creating an array. We're going to fill it with something, but we don't know what we're going to fill it yet. 
So we'll do square bracket, open and close square brackets, semicolon. Square brackets means, well, this is an array. It'll hold more than one variable, but we don't know what it's going to hold yet. So it holds nothing. But we're setting it up that this is going to hold multiple things. We didn't do that here because it'll only hold one thing at a time, basically. notes. Square brackets is for an array. An array holds multiple variables. Down here, a plain var is a variable that holds one item at a time equals assigns to a variable. The thing on the right is put into the thing on the left. Notice I'm doing single line comments here single line and then I just tabbed it over so that it lines up, nothing special, but these are single line comments. It might have been more efficient to put the multi-line, but it's faster. Don't be afraid to write comments all over the place. If they're helpful to you, they're good. They help explain to yourself what your code does or to other people on your team and such. Okay, so what I want to do is I've got I've got a, a container where I can hold multiple containers. I've got that array back on line uh, 33. I need to start to fill it with what the uh, what the people are typing into the box. So what I'm going to do then is um, put the array put the item into the array. After console log, <clears throat> back inside the name save function, we we'll write all names. We're about to put what did the person type at the moment and put it into that array. Now, because it's a special kind of variable, it has special kinds of methods. Um, unfortunately, it's not that we would then do, so don't write. It, it would make sense from everything that I've said that I would do something like this, temp name, but don't do this. That would make sense. That would make sense if this was a simple variable where I'm putting into it a simple variable. If it was, this could work. Put the name here into here. But this is a, an array. It holds multiple elements. So we have to do it like this. There is a built-in uh, method here dot push, open close parentheses, push. We're going to take an item and push it into this uh, array. The item that we're pushing into it is temp name. Whatever the person typed temporarily, put it into, push it into the variable. Cool, I want to see what that looks like. Console dot log all names show me all the names that I've started to store into that array in the console. Let's see if that works. Save it and run it. Put, type one name, click save. Open your console, remember, F12. Add another name, save. You should see that it's going to start to add multiple names to the one array.
Let's see. Save that. I'm going to open my console because I'm going to get results there. So right away I hit F12 to bring up the console. I'm going to put in one name. Save. My console responds with the very first console output, which was temp name. And then it says, then you've got an array, Victor. Okay, I'm going to put in another name. John. Save. It says, okay. We just uh, type John, and we put it into the array. Janet. Save. You just type Janet. That's temp name. And then all names in the order that I added them in. Victor, John, Janet. Keep saving. Keep adding. Yes. Why does it appear as a print in the same? We never programmed it to do that. We never told it to. That's the thing here. It doesn't disappear. We're so used to anywhere else that we type it in and it takes it away. We never said to do that. So this is very literal. This does exactly what we tell it. And therefore, if we didn't tell it to do something, it probably won't do it. We can make it do that with a little more code. But the default, it does, it does not take it away. I can click cancel and that'll clear it. That defeats the purpose. So we can program it to make it do more things. So did everyone get something like that? Are you starting to store multiple names in one array? All right, back to our code. So, so far I have the functionality that I've got an input box, save, I don't really have a retrieve yet. It's coming out in my console, but I want to now pick a random um, name out of the out of the array. Out of the array, I want to take out one random name. So that means we need to build upon some of the things we've done so far. Um, that is, we need some sort of trigger to do that. We can tie it all together, but let's make it obvious in that, okay, I've got a button to save it. I've got a button to cancel. I'm going to make a new button to, to give me a random name. When I choose, give me a new random name. It'll then check throughout the array. Pick a random one and then display it on screen. So that will require a new button and the placeholder to display the name on screen. That'll mean we need a little bit more uh, HTML. We need, again, some structural or content added to the document a button and a placeholder to show the name. Back to our code. We'll back up back into the form after after the input box after the buttons let's add an HR a horizontal rule <coughs> to kind of divide this up a little bit visually and then input I'm gonna make another button type button value uh, what do we call this random random name pick one now we'll call it pick one I won't set the class just yet but obviously if I set the class the button will look the same as the other buttons you could do that if you want but we need an ID because again we need to link this JavaScript with that button together, so we will do one called um, btn get name. We're, we're making this up. We're giving it a unique ID. I like to do it this way in that, okay, this is a button, so I prefix it with button. 
this was an input box, I prefixed it with input, not necessary, but I, I want to do it that way. And then what does it do? It gets a name. This is a button that gets a name. That was an input that had a name. <coughs> Next line. Here's a new HTML tag. We haven't talked about this one yet. This is one that we use often. This is a generic container. This is the div tag. It has a pair. I believe it stands for division. It's a, it's a generic container. It's an invisible container that we can do multiple things to it. It's like having an invisible box. We can store things into it. But because it's digital, we can change the color of that invisible box to red, a red box. We can change the size of the text in the box. So it's just a generic container. But in order for us to control it, such as adding the random name to it, we should, re we should name it somehow to reference it. So let's add an ID to this also. Let's give this also an ID so that the JavaScript can take the random name out of the array and display it on screen. This is my placeholder to display the name on screen. Let's give it an ID. Call this div get name. This is a div where we got the name. I suppose we can call it div got name. Div get name, div got name. Whatever we call these things, we need to keep them consistent. Again, these naming conventions, whatever you want. But notice I'm using the intercaps twice. Three words here, just for readability. Capital G, capital M, capital G, capital M. They're IDs, so we could not use btn get name twice. An ID can only be used once per document. Let's see, visually. Presentation-wise, got the original stuff up here. Dividing line, click one, click that. Nothing happens. We haven't programmed it yet. There's an invisible container right below it. Below it, it'll say the name once we pick a name. So we're going to need something very similar that we've already created. We're going to need to do this document element by ID again. We're going to need to activate that button again and then define a unique function to make it do what we want it to do. So we'll do something similar to that again. Back to our script block. Next line. Document dot get element by ID. I have to say which ID do I need. We call it btm get name. In quotes, it's a literal btn get name. I seem to forget right away what I name my things, especially when I'm talking out loud. So I called it btn get name. Just like before, dot on click. After the event of clicking, that button do something like that up there. Same syntax. The syntax we will use over and over. We will have a shorthand later. If you recall a while ago, I asked how many of you in JavaScript and how many of you had heard of jQuery. We'll get to that later. In short, jQuery is like JavaScript shortcuts. Because eventually, it's going to get tiresome to write this over and over. Eventually, um, this can be written like this. All of this can be written like this in, Java, in jQuery later. Don't worry about that yet. Um, same thing as before, function, parentheses, curly braces, semicolon. All of that, that's plain old JavaScript. jQuery is a way to write this faster and easier. We'll get to it later. We'll see why it's valuable. And so I need to define 
and I need to make up some some function to then process this. Uh, so we'll call this one, uh, I guess just um, btn save, name save, name, what do we call it? Um, get name, sure. Get name parentheses. I'm going to call, we're going to invoke, we're going to run the get name function, which we need to make that up. There's no get name JavaScript command built in. So next line, function get name curly braces to define what that means. Function get name parentheses curly braces like we did a little while ago. We're going to invent a get name function get name command. This is going to be multiple lines, so actually I'm going to break those curly braces into multiple lines. I guess, of course, I write the pairs of things so that I don't forget to close the pair within line 50, whatever yours is, in the get name function. We don't know... Um, we need to pick. Um, we might have three names or 30 names in the array. We want to pick one of those 30. Um, we don't know how many names are in the array until we check. So there is a way for us to easily check how many items have we put into this array. So we're going to, at this moment, when we click the get a random name, we have to first check how many do we have to choose from. Then we'll pick a random one. So we'll create another variable, another sort of temporary variable to help us pick a random, um, a random name. And we're going to pick a a random, remember all names is storing all our names. I want to know how many names do I have in that array. So we'll create a variable called all names length. What, uh, what name would you use if we were going to invent a language? I want to pick, I want to see how many items are in an array. You know, how many things are in an array. What one word would you use to define that? Size. Member, size, good ones. They pick length. Length means how many are in that array. Size would have been good, members, etc. Length is what JavaScript uses <coughs> to check how many of something is in, an array, is in an array. So we're creating a variable to store, to check, how many items do I have in that array. And at the same time as we create it, we'll fill it. The actual command to check that is all names dot length, semicolon. No parentheses there, even though that doesn't look like the syntax that we've been doing. Um, there are inconsistent things here and there. The parentheses would mean that it's a method, that it's a command, but I'm not really running a command. I'm checking a, I'm, I'm checking an attribute. What's the length? How many names do I have in here? Seven. Put seven, the number seven, put it into this variable, this container, which we could have called anything. Could have called it kitty cat. I'm calling it all names length. How many names do I have in that array? Now I know how many I have to choose from. Seven names. 70 names, 700 names. So then, now we need to choose randomly from those seven. Next line. Create another variable. We'll call it random name.
equals. So we're going to pick a random number. There's a built-in JavaScript method that lets us pick, pick random numbers. The syntax of that is math, capital M, that needs a capital M. When they were inventing this, they uh, chose a capital M there, math.random method, semicolon. This generates a random number. I'm not quite done yet, but let's do console.log random name. Let's see this in action. Let's see if it's working so far. Not quite there yet, but let's see what we get here. I want to display the random number that I've made up in the console. We're not dealing with the names yet. This should happen once you click the button to get a name. Let's see. Remember to pull up your console. There's the pick one button. I'll click it. Random number. Random number. Random number. Lots of random numbers. Between 0 and 1, which means an infinite number of numbers between 0 and 1. You just go into smaller fractions. 0 0.2, 0 0.08, 0 0.9, 0 0.8. Random numbers. That's not exactly what I what I want. I want to pick the first name or the second name or the third name. Not the one half name and the three quarters name. I want a whole number. So let's back up on our code here. The way to force it to choose between our seven names is to then multiply this number by the total number we have to choose from. The total number we have to choose from is stored right here, all names land. So we'll do math.random times the total number that we can choose from. And times multiplication in JavaScript is the asterisk, shift 8, space all names length. Now we're forcing it to go up to the maximum number of names we have. Let's save it. Put in a couple names, two or three names. Um, add a few names, then click Save, and then it'll start to pick numbers up to the number of names that you saved. Okay, let's pull up my console. So just very quickly, I'm going to put in a few just gibberish names. I put four gibberish names. It doesn't care what I put. But I put four names. I'm going to click pick one. Three point two. 2.3, 0 0.3, 0.34, 0.92. Now it's picking numbers that actually have a whole number with still a fraction. Okay, let me add another. Now I've got up to five to choose from. Pick one. Now it's going to go perhaps up to five. Yes. Am I getting the numbers? Okay, let me finish my thought here, then I'll help you in just a moment. Um, we still need to refine this a little bit. We need whole numbers. There is the first item and the second item. There is not the one and a half item. It's either one or two. So we need to round this off. We need to round this into whole numbers. And the funny thing is that I have five items, 
but the computer is going to start counting them from zero. This is the zeroth item, the first item, the second item, the third item, the fourth item. Not the first item, the second item, the third item, the fourth, the fifth. It's not going to count with natural numbers. One, two, three, four, five. Computers count starting from zero. So there's a zero with item. Zero, one, two, three, four. So I need to pick a number between actually zero and four, not one and five. So it's easier than you think. We're going to round these numbers down. 3.5 will be rounded down to 3. 1.7 will be rounded down to 1. 0 0.9 will be rounded down to 0. So 0 would be the 0th item. 3.5 would be the third item. 0, 1, 2, 3. 1.7. What's that? that? You said the third item. The third item is the fourth item. Yes, the, the fourth item. In the array. So 1.7 rounds down to 1, 0, 1. So we're going to round, we're going to force everything to round down. We could round up, we could round down, but we have to force it to round down or else we would never pick the 0th item. That would round up to 1 and we wouldn't hit the 0. We would never get the 0th index number. So the trick here is we're going to round all of this, we're going to round it down no matter what. So watch this first. Watch this first. It's very easy to lose track. I'm going to put parentheses around the whole thing here, except for the semicolon, of course, that ends the statement. I'm going to put parentheses all the way around this. This is like in regular old math class, that if we have something like 1 plus 2 times 3 divided by 4, there is an order of operations. You have to do division and multiplication first before you do addition and subtraction. It's just more plain math. So here, sort of, I'm going to say let's force to create a number in the order, first with those parentheses, and then let's round it down. So we'll back up to the first, right before the first parenthesis, and we'll write math.floor because we can round up to the ceiling and we can round down to the floor. It's just a funny thing that is built in. Math.floor means take whatever number you have and round it down always. Math.seal, as in ceiling, will always round it up. And I think we have math.round, which it will choose up or down, depending if it's more than 5 or less than 5. But we always want it to go down, so the floor is down. That's how it's programmed. Now run it, put some names in, and now they will be whole numbers always rounded down. So console, put in some names. OK, five names. Pick one. Zero, which would be ASFD. Pick another. Three, which would be zero, one, two, three. X, or Z, X, Z. Pick another. One, which would be Q, W, E, R. Pick another one, which would be Three again. Pick another one. Two. Zero. One. Two. So what I'm getting at is you use a website, you use an app, you click a button, it does something. <laughs> Automatically, right away, you don't think about it, it does it. We here, little by little, have been building up a very basic thing. And in my case, I've got it up to 55 lines or so with comments and such. What I'm getting at is that's why JavaScript could be the hardest one. There's so much that we have to do and take into account to get even basic things, such as the very good question about, well, why didn't that name go away?
we never programmed it to do that, so it didn't do it. So we're almost there. One more thing, and then we'll be done. I'll put my code in the network folder. I'll do individual help and such. The last thing is, OK, great. We've got a random number, which is a position in the array. Show that name on screen. I've got a placeholder for it. Next, we've got document dot get element by ID. What's the name of my placeholder on screen? Div get name. Thank you. The placeholder is on screen for the purpose of showing the name. Let's get it. Let's use it. We'll set its attribute dot inner HTML. That one does have all capital HTML. That's just the way they did it. I guess it's not consistent. Why didn't they do, why didn't they do all caps there? But here we're about to write some HTML into this div on screen. As I said, JavaScript can do a lot. Right here, we're going to dynamically write HTML equals. And in this case, equals is like these previous ones. Take the thing on the right, put it into the thing on the left. Take the thing on the right, the random name, and put it into the div on the left. So we will say all names, brackets. Remember, brackets means we're, we're talking about an array. If we were to run it at this point, this would spit out all the names in the array. I didn't specify which item of the array. There's an array. Put all the names on screen. If I put a number here, 0, put the 0th item of the array on screen. Put the 5th item on screen, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Put the 5th item on screen. We have a random number, random name. This is a number. We just saw it. We're inventing a random number based on the amount of names we have. So pick, get that random number, go to that position of the array, display it on screen. Put some, save it and run it. Put some names in that array, maybe some real names this time, and pick one. Save Joseph Save Michael Save Armin Save Pick one Michael Pick one Victor Pick one Victor again Pick one Victor again Pick one Joseph Pick one Armin I'm going to add again to the array, a brand new item in the array. Now it goes from 0 uh, to 4. Add another name. Save. This will still work. Pick one. There's Julia. Pick one. There's Armin again. There's Michael. Armin. Julia. 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 Armin. Patricia. an array holding a bunch of names that we can add to. We would have to further program, oops, I misspelled the name. We would have to further program to edit the item in the array. It's giving me a random number here. You might have wanted to ask, well, why do I have to keep adding names to the array? I just added a name. As soon as you reset it, pick one, there's nothing in the array. We haven't gotten to the point of saving these names permanently. So as soon as we refresh, or reload the, the code, there's, there's nothing in that array. We haven't programmed that. As I start adding names, let me save Patricia. Pick one. Patricia, obviously. Patricia number one. P 
Patricia number 12, Patricia number 123, pick. So uh, there's uh, still a lot that we can do with this. Uh, we can do, do we want it to accept, because we can do some weird things here. I can put nothing in this box and click Save, and it saved a blank name. I can then retrieve a blank name if it comes up random. There it is. Got it on the first try. I can put nothing in here. I can put one, two, three, four, five empty spaces and save that, and it saved a name of five empty blank spaces. I can put in here this. What's that? That's Bugs Bunny cursing at you. No one gets it. So I can save weird characters, special characters. It'll take it. It's not really a name, but it'll take it. I can put numbers just by themselves, one, two, three, save that, it'll take it. You know, right now there's nothing special to further test for good data. It just does what you told. Save whatever the person typed. We would have to program more some sort of checks and balances. Don't accept numbers. Um, don't accept, you know, special characters, you know, copyright symbol. Put that in. It won't care. I didn't program it to care. So there's your name, copyright 2016. That's how these things can happen. These hacks can happen. Hackers say, let me try to put in code into the login box. Ooh, they didn't, they didn't strip out special characters. I'm in, and I stole credit cards. So we, as the programmer, have so much to, to deal with here. Is it proper, um, properly formatted? Am I accepting certain characters? Am I even giving back any feedback, you know, if it's working or not? If I have no items in the array and try to pick one, it's going to give me the weird undefined. The user's going to say, what does that mean? I should program it to further say, please enter a name first. So we have to take care of so much as a programmer. That's why programming can be full of bugs and have problems and, and, and vulnerabilities because it's regular people, flawed people creating software, perhaps in teams, and problems show up. So we're out of time, but uh, today we had another quick crash course in some more HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. This is just the tip of the tip of the iceberg. I'm going to put my code into the network folder. If I didn't get a chance to answer your question, I will in a moment. But I'm going to put my code in the folder in case you want a copy of mine. Mine seems to have worked. You might want a co copy of it. So let me remind you. And I'll put these notes that I wrote also. I'll put them all in the network folder. We'll do it again next week, and we'll, we'll keep on going. So thanks for coming.